It was just an ordinary night at Site 19, and Dr. Smith was hard at work in his office. The overhead light was just about ready to give out, the bulb dim and flickering, but there was no one available to change it at the moment, so he would just make do. Besides, he only had a little bit of work left to finish. Hunched over his desk, eyes bleary and head aching from too many hours of staring at a screen, he was ready to wrap up this report and finally get home for some well-deserved rest. The constant anxiety of working with some of the scariest monsters in the world was one thing, but the hours spent writing paperwork on the monsters was an altogether different kind of terrifying. Most of the research staff had left for the night, and only Dr. Smith and the usual security team remained in the building. There was no sound except the click of his fingers on the keys, his occasional exhausted sigh, and the infrequent sound of footsteps in the hall outside as a security officer made his rounds. Dr. Smith leaned back in his chair, stretching his arms over his head and feeling his back crack. Almost done. He recalled dimly a thermos of tea he had left on the shelf behind him. Perhaps that would be the kick he needed to finish this work up and get home to his bath, his books, and his pet cat, Roger. He swiveled his chair around, preparing to stand up and retrieve the thermos when he suddenly came face to face with a nightmare. There, less than an inch from him, was a smooth, featureless face, black as the night and devoid of any expression. It was hunched over, its face peering into him, despite not having any eyes itself. Without a sound, without so much as a creak of the door, this thing had come into his office and appeared behind him, waiting for him to turn around and see it. Dr. Smith let out a shriek of terror, knocking his chair over as he scrambled to get away from the intruder. His heart pounding in his ears, he tore past the dark figure, yanking open the door to his office and taking off running down the hall. He called out for help, for someone, anyone to come. Several security personnel heard his cries and rushed to see what had happened. They found a shivering Dr. Smith babbling about a demon in his office and repeating, it doesn't have a face over and over again. Once he had calmed down and finally been given that cup of tea, Dr. Smith was informed that as stressful as that encounter might have been, he was never really in any danger. We don't have another SCP-173 on our hands here, thankfully. This statue isn't murderous or even violent. To the best of our observational ability, we've determined that this particular surprisingly mobile statue is just kind of a jerk. SCP-650, nicknamed the Startling Statue, is a stylized black statue of a humanoid figure, standing at 167 centimeters tall. It has no hands or facial features, its arms extending in rounded points and its face and head a smooth surface like that of a mannequin. When the statue is dormant, or at least resting and waiting for its next chance to move, it stands straight and reaches upwards, head tilted up as if its non-existent eyes are watching the sky. Attempts to determine the materials of the statue is made of have proved inconclusive. Some tests show an impossibly large combination of different materials, where other tests came back with no matches for any recognized materials at all. If no one is observing the statue, it will move to a place immediately behind whoever is in the room with it, switching its pose to a more threatening one. It moves silently, and no one has been able to capture evidence of its method of locomotion. All that is known is that it does, in fact, move, and it always appears extremely close to the subject of its interest, in order to provoke a strong flight-or-fight reaction. The statue seems to have no interest in harming those it frightens, never touching or directly interacting with anyone. It only seems interested in startling its victims, if you can even call them victims. It can be unpleasant to be unexpectedly frightened like that, sure, but you get the same experience at most Halloween attractions or horror movies, and people pay good money for those. Several trials were conducted in order to determine the statue's pattern of behavior. In a trial, an SCP Foundation agent was assigned to stand in the statue's containment unit and watch the object for a period of time. When prompted by a researcher in another room speaking to them via radio, they were ordered to look away from the statue. Once cleared to look at the statue again, they were ordered to look around the room and report where it went and what it was doing. In most of the experiments, the statue appeared directly behind the personnel, angled with its arms reaching towards them and its head glaring down at them, as if about to attack. In nearly every trial, the statue hit the same position, and the agent looking at it was startled to the point of screaming. 
There was even talk of cutting footage of all the screams together into a video that would be shown at the company Christmas party. However, in three cases, the statue adopted a different pose as well as a position in the room, much to the surprise and confusion of the team conducting the experiments. When Agent Dunn was assigned to observe the statue, he was asked to close his eyes for five seconds and wait for SCP-650 to move. When he opened his eyes, the first thing he did was whirl around and look behind him, having heard about the results of the previous tests. However, when he turned to face the statue, there was nothing there. He turned back around to his original stance, preparing to radio command and tell them the statue was gone, when he let out a yelp of surprise. There at the table, in the corner several feet away, was the statue. It was lying on the table with its arms behind its head, as if relaxing, with the area considered to be its face turned directly towards Dunn. Unsettled by the surprise and definitely uncomfortable with how the statue seemed to be looking at him, he left the room without another word. At another point in the trials, Agent Riley pulled the short straw and was told to enter 650's containment. She stood in the center of the room and stared at the statue in front of her for a long period of time. When given the command, she closed her eyes and waited for a duration of 30 seconds. Much like Agent Dunn, her first instinct on opening her eyes was to turn around and look behind her, ready to see the statue there. Instead, however, it was sitting on a chair at the other end of the room, the points where its hands should be neatly folded in its lap. Its body was facing away from Agent Riley, but even though she was looking at what could have easily been the back of the statue's head, she later reported the distinct sense that it was looking at her. Though she didn't scream like her colleagues had when it was their turn to watch the statue, she confessed to feeling an overwhelming sense of unease, and her hands would not stop shaking for the next several hours. These two instances of the statue adopting a casual posture and keeping its distance from its observers were bizarre, but the final break from the statue's usual behavior was the strangest of them all. Agent Cho was sent into SCP-650's containment and told to stand with his back against the wall of his choice. The plan was to determine what the statue would do if its unusual favorite position, just behind the observer, was no longer an option. If there was no space behind Agent Cho, then the statue could not turn up there. Once he was settled into his spot and had been watching the statue for several minutes, Agent Cho closed his eyes for exactly one minute. When he opened them, he immediately scanned the room to see where the statue had gone. It was not at the table or the chair, nor was it standing in its original place in front of him. Finally, he spotted it. The statue was huddled in the corner of the room, curled up in an approximation of the fetal position. Its head was down, and its arms were held up in front of its face as if trying to protect itself. Though he could not explain why, Agent Cho got a distinct impression that the statue was afraid. His stomach dropped at the sight, and he would later admit to his supervisor that he briefly thought about trying to comfort SCP-650 somehow. The impulse passed, but Cho was left with a mixture of anxiety and guilt, as if he had done something wrong and upset the statue. The sensation did not pass until he was out of the room. It is not entirely clear why the statue chose these alternative poses during these particular experiments. The prevailing theory among the research team is that these are simply other tools in its arsenal, methods that it can use to elicit a strong reaction from a person who is less likely to be startled by its usual trick. Following the incident with Dr. Smith, SCP-650 was upgraded from Safe Class to Euclid Class. Just to clarify for people in the back, Euclid Class SCPs are not necessarily considered to be dangerous, but require more effort to contain than objects classified as safe. Most SCPs that display autonomy or independent thought but are not overtly hostile towards humanity are classified as Euclid. Along with its updated status, special containment procedures have been employed in order to keep this startling statue from making any more surprise escapes. SCP-650 is to be stored in a locked room, 4 meters by 4 meters. It is to be kept under constant surveillance by at least three personnel at any given time standing so that the SCP and at least one of the observers are visible to them at all times. They are allowed to watch the statue remotely via security camera, as long as they remain focused on the SCP. This method is only to be employed in case of emergency. A great deal of the Foundation's budget was dedicated to maintaining up-to-date containment facilities for SCP-650, as demanded in a note from Dr. Smith in the official file for SCP-650. The note reads, I don't give a flying rat about the budget, keep this damn thing contained! 
Turning around in a dim office to see this thing a half inch away from your nose is guaranteed to take years from your life. And given what we deal with, we don't have many to spare. So, what does this startling statue want? Why does it use its power of mobility to scare people but never do anything beyond that? No one is certain, and the Foundation has too many other fires to put out to bother looking further into a clearly benign entity. Unfortunately, there are questions about SCP-650 that will never be answered, and there is so much about it we will never know. One thing is for sure, though. If you find yourself alone in a room with an unsettling statue, you had better keep an eye on it, just in case. Now go check out SCP-173 Origin Story How SCP-173 Got to Site-19, and SCP-689 Haunter in the Dark for more of the SCP Foundation's strange and frightening statues.